Today we speak with the Joneses, a family of expats that moved to Medellin, Colombia. Okay, so um, I'm here with Nicole and Phil Jones. I'm here with the Joneses. We are in Medellin, <laughs> Colombia. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever it is you're located. So we want to ask them a couple of questions, but uh, we more so wanted to get uh, more information about what it's like to be an expat moving from the U.S. here with a family, not just a couple, but with children as well. So uh, let's, let's just jump right in and uh, where are you guys from? What made you think of coming to Medellin? How was it like so far? So we're from Atlanta, Georgia, like right outside of Atlanta. Uh, and we have very diverse backgrounds as far as coming to, or actually traveling in general. Mm -hmm. We started traveling around in the RV, uh, and as we went further and further away in an RV, we started opening up our minds to doing other adventures. One of these adventures was going out of the country to Colombia in general. Not specifically Medellin, but Colombia in, in general. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so uh, what was the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what made you come to Medellin? Right, well, tell so me the story. I know you were just telling me that you, you guys came here January 1st of this year. Yes. Yeah. And you actually counted down while you were on the plane. Yeah, yeah we, we, we were like the down first, on the plane. first plane to hit Medellin right. at, the end of, at the beginning of the year. We counted down over, uh, as a matter of fact, when we went right over Cartagena mm -hmm. is when we got to midnight. Right. So by the time we got here, it was like 1 a.m. Wow. So it was yeah, so we drove through the streets. We heard all the parties. Yeah, it was, um, I was scared. Fireworks, and it didn't stop. Even the next day when we yeah. woke up, people were still partying. See, they went to sleep. See, I was <laughs> up the whole night. I, I couldn't. I was. I was. I was scared out of my mind. All right, so we had to take the the cab ride here. Well, if you're not used to going up Ooh. and down in elevation, you will get sick. And That's they drove the tunnel too. So fast. before the tunnel, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so. You know, on the way here, we actually had uh, someone I was talking to on the at the airport, and he said I had to take Dramamine before I come to <laughs> I'm like Dramamine. I'm like, okay. So we started heading down. We hopped in a cab, which was crazy scary. Why? Because our Spanish sucked. It was horrible. And so trying to get to this Airbnb, we never really seen before. We don't know how to get there, so we're using Google Google Maps. We didn't even know what a Porteria was, no. okay? The the guy was saying, the Porteria, go to the Porteria and get the key. And we're like, but we're trying to yeah. translate the Porteria. Like, we have so like no the idea. The what <laughs> like, what we no, it's the, the door. Yeah. No, the, the door. door. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go to the door. Go to the door and get the key. We have no, we had no idea what that like, was. On, really? But so. our Spanish now has improved significantly. But when we first came, it was very poor, <laughs> very yeah. poor. So you didn't speak? Spanish at all or just well, I mean very, we knew like little. yeah we knew good morning good night you know I could count to 10 bye yeah wow so you start this year you started from yeah. scratch, scratch really? yeah. yeah even the, the children they had no prior knowledge of the language and both my son and daughter know how to they know how to do well pretty much with yeah. other kids I heard them talking to each other uh, earlier today and I didn't know that they knew certain words so it's amazing how being in the culture, being emerged quickly, you pick up on things. Yeah. You it's have pretty, to use it. It's yeah, worse. it's necessary. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, well, let me ask you, what made you think of Medellin? Of all places in the world, I know you've been to Costa Rica, yeah. been to Mexico. Uh, I'm gonna ask you later too, where else have you been? But uh, what made you pick Medellin? Colombia in general, and then Medellin specifically? Well, initially, I gotta say it was my idea to go to <laughs> Colombia. So, okay, I, I figured Columbia. I started looking at the cost of living and up-and-coming areas. And one of the areas I think was underrated was Columbia in general. I didn't know specifically Medellin. So I'm a scuba diver, and I, I thought the best way to get more scuba diving in was to go to the coast. And the hot city near the coast, I was thinking about, like, it's literally hot, is Cartagena. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to get her to come down to Cartagena for around six months. And so... Uh, secretly, she had a, a different plan, which we, we found out. <laughs> yeah, I did some research on Cartagena, and I realized that it was too hot. And let me tell you, we were in Key West as he was talking about going to Cartagena. <laughs> you can feel that no, heat already. Key West, mm -hmm. and Key West was miserably summer. hot. Oh, yeah. And so I said, well, let me check out some other places. And I came across Medellin, and I 
realized that the climate was perfect. Everyone kept talking about the climate and the infrastructure and, you know, the internet is working well. And, you know, I thought this will be a place where I think our family will thrive. And so we never been here before uh, prior to us coming. We, I booked tickets and we just took a jump. And here we are eight months later yeah. and doing pretty well. So, okay. well, yeah. Let me back up even further. Mm -hmm. What made you leave the U.S. or want to leave the U.S.? Leave the matrix, leave everything behind. Well, we broke a couple of laws. No, <laughs> <laughs> so, no uh, we both had really high intensity uh, corporate jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, me as a network engineer and my wife is being a project manager for some very reputable companies. Uh, but in that, we had a requirement to work very intensely on what our careers were. Uh, as an engineer, I'm all about statistics and numbers. Mm -hmm. So I started figuring out the statistics about how much time am I spending with the kids. And I figured that out to be come up to around between 14.5 and 15 uh, percent of the time of the year. So I figured between kindergarten and high school, I would have actually spent four years with them, which is, is not, I, I think it's not uh, good. Yeah, it was definitely the quality. I think we realized that we were investing in more of our material things than we were in our family, our relationships. Um, and we decided that we wanted to just peel back. Of course, we did our research and took our time and figuring out how and it, it was a very intense process. But, you know, we just thought if we saw other people on YouTube and we we're like, if they can do it, somehow we can figure it out. And that's what we did little by little. We just figured out how we can peel away, you I, know. I, I think we wanted to do a lot of research. And while we may have done a lot of research later on in the game, initially, when we first started, it was always, we're always on the move, ready to go. So we did a lot of traveling inside the United States. Right. And it was sometimes it would be impromptu. Uh, to just different places, anywhere from New Orleans to up in the Smoky Mountains. So if you go under that impression, what we did was in our character. It's what we did. Right. Let's go. Let's plan, but let's go. Right. We made that decision relatively fast. Yeah, we did. But, I mean, that's our history. I think that we <laughs> move fast. Yeah. That's just how we have some kind of synergy where we just... Yeah. We make up our minds and we just do it. We do it, we do it until there's little, little, little resistance. You, you know? have some caution there, but you can't rely specifically on the fear factor. Right. People get caught up into that fear factor and what holds them back is that fear of loss, the fear of losing money, jobs, friends. Yep. And so at some point you have to make that leap. Yeah. You have to take that leap of faith. Yeah. Okay. Well, you guys not only took a leap, but you took a leap together as a couple, and you also took a leap with children too. Yeah. So let's talk schools briefly. I know we spoke of it a, a, a while back inside, but you moved the kids here uh, January 1st, and mm -hmm. I think that happened to be the time where school begins here. It's not like a regular U.S. school year where it begins in uh, August, September, and runs through June right. or May, June. Here it starts in January, so there's you had to go through an open enrollment process or get interviews and so on. It's more interviews. It's uh, the interviews are more about behavior. Uh, they want they want to see psychologically where your child is, also uh, where they are mentally, how they learn, how they interact with other children before they make the investment in the child. Which, you know, at first we frowned upon it because we were like, they need to hurry up. Why can't they get our kids in school? But that's a really good thing, I would say, to really see or review how you can invest in each child individually. I would say that's a great thing here. Um, but the process is very annoying, it's very frustrating. It takes time. You go to different schools um, to figure out, you know, if they will even accept your child. Yeah. He had his feet on the ground. He knows way more about it than I do. So if you yeah. want to give your... Initially, it wasn't about hitting the ground and getting into schools. Uh, initially, we had our one, our, our daughter wasn't in school, but our son was do, being homeschooled. And that's kind of a continuation of what we were doing back in the States. We're doing a lot of traveling in the United States, is we had to find a solution in that, and that was homeschooling. So when we got down here, although we were interested in the, education, the educational aspects, it was more from a homeschooling standpoint. 
So we had to make sure, you know, you had internet and uh, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. uh, what we found out, though, was that we, it would be better for the kids to have more of the social aspect, especially being in a new country. Yeah. Why not experience a new language, learn a new language? And the best way to do that is to become integrated into the schools locally. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was good for us because we could have some separation because we were on the road with them for, what, six months. <laughs> it's every day, you know, yeah, you homeschooling how. and spending time, which was good, but we needed a little bit of time to ourselves. Yeah. You learn a lot. <laughs> about the family and 600 square feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, to say the least, uh, we ended up finding a school that fit our children's needs and was real willing to invest in our children, even though they knew that um, they didn't really have an English speaking program specifically for our kids. They do have a um, curriculum that involves English, believe it or not. But I think our children, actually there's a couple of more children there that are from the States, yeah. which is great. But the classes are smaller. Yeah. Um, now that's what else? specifically for the school we're at now. Yeah. But typically for the, the school structure here, it's usually 40, 40 kids to one teacher. Right. On average. And that's me visiting four different schools. They mm -hmm. all said around the same thing. Yeah. So depending on what time you get here, another thing that you have to be aware of is that the school spaces fill up relatively fast. And if you want to not just get caught up in to the politics of having a, any English speaking people there, the public schools seem to be a little bit more difficult as where the private schools are willing to uh, subjugate the kids into a little bit more of an English style uh, format and introduce them to being bilingual. Uh, the thing about it is, is that even though their want is there, uh, the infrastructure is not there. So you might have more tourism and more Americans, more English speaking people, but they may not have the infrastructure to accomplish it. One, one of the things that they did with us was to try to structure uh, a program specifically for our kids. Did the people that you had to communicate with at the schools, did they all speak English? No. <laughs> That's your first challenge. I can imagine you're going from school to school and speaking with a limited of amount of Spanish, yeah. Usually at each <laughs> school, they would have one person, one or two people that spoke English. As a matter and of fact, we would use those people, you know, like, hey, yeah. you know, whatever you're doing, I'm sorry that we have to interrupt whatever you're doing, but we need you for an hour. And, and they would come in the room yeah. with us. You know, a lot of people, they hired um like translators uh -huh. sometimes we would just use the resource that was there mm -hmm. you know and save us a buck or two yeah when you would think that okay you have the teachers that would be more familiar with english but that's not the case mm -mm. a lot of the older generation of people the english part of that there's a there was, gap there's a gap i found yeah. that out yeah mm -hmm. so and, and we don't know exactly what that gap caused i think they they wanted to re re arrange the infrastructure here for being more competitive on a global standpoint right. and they realized that English had to be one of the competencies here. Gotcha. So before you decided to move here, did you get any pushback from family, friends? Did you get any questions? What's wrong with you? Yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I know I did specifically. He says no, but I think uh, people were just, with my job, typically you don't leave, right? Like. I mean, I worked for a, uh, a plant, and so people retire there. They work 30, 30 years up, and they don't leave. And so when I presented it to my friends and coworkers, they thought I was a little nuts. There were some people that thought it was brave, and they wanted to do the same thing if they could, you know, back in the day. Um, my parents were dead on, and um, so, yeah, and our neighbors thought we were bizarre. Yeah, well, you're talking about going from really cushy jobs, right? Uh -huh. So at that point, I was working as an engineer, making really good money, but everything else was missing. So when I decided to leave, the sentiment, the general sentiment from the people I work with, oh, I wish I could do that, I want to do that, you know, hopefully I get a chance, you know, go for it. Uh, from the, my family, from my side of family, it was more, okay, you know, go ahead and, you know, go, because they know I'm crazy anyway. So they said, okay, just, you know, just be safe and, you know, contact us and let us know, take care of your family, but you're good. So it was a really big difference yeah. in the people. But, very polarized. Yeah, very polarized. <clears throat> but 
you know, honestly, my view, personal viewpoints on it is if you have a bunch of people that are telling a bunch of negative stuff about traveling and experiencing new things, you might want to evaluate who your real friends are. And who you're getting that information yeah. from. Because the true friends are going to want the best for you and your kids, and they're going to more so encourage you. But if they do have any concerns, it won't be focused toward negative aspects in your travels. Right. We have a YouTube channel. Like it. Please subscribe and kick the bell.